And I titled today's talk, Access to Memory, not only because it's the name of an archival search engine, but because I, I want to engage with the ways that government support, or in this case, lack thereof, for history work impacts how and when, and indeed if people encounter certain stories and narratives about the past. During this era that we're living in of misinformation and disinformation, truth and reconciliation, climate disaster, rising fascism and white supremacy, when narratives about the past are being deployed to enact violence and hate, the work of conserving, studying, and interpreting the past remains as important as ever. Especially work that links these present issues to our past and helps explain how it is that we got here. Yet government support for this work in British Columbia is piecemeal or ad hoc, if it exists at all. I hope to show today that despite ongoing advocacy, it is my view that we as a sector have had only limited success in pushing back against neoliberal ideology and governments that see history or heritage work as at best a potential contribution to gross domestic product and overall economic growth. And I'll be using history and heritage interchangeably here. If those of us working in and supporting history work want to see significant change, then we need to be willing to speak out against the very structures and yes, governments that have created the current situation. Personally, I have yet to see how waiting for the right politician to see things the way we do has had a positive impact. Now, let me be very clear. Today, I will be speaking about the ways that public history shows up in my work and my life. Nothing I will say today is to suggest that vital public history work, in some cases, yes, supported by government funding, is not happening in BC. You'll be hearing about a lot of that work throughout this conference. This work is being done by volunteers, communities, professionals, academics. However, when I look at the three areas where my life and work intersect with public history, I remain deeply concerned about the future of a well-paid and well-supported public history sector in British Columbia. These three areas are as follows. In my work as executive director at Point Ellis House Museum and Gardens, which is a provincially owned heritage site here in Victoria. As president of the Friends of the British Columbia Archives, which is a, a not-for-profit society, and as a contract adjunct non-regular faculty member in the Department of History at Vancouver Island University. For today's presentation, I'll touch upon some of the ways that each of these areas is subject to declining or stagnant government support and the impact that this has on access to memory. I'll then discuss some of the recent funding initiatives and rhetoric and context that surrounds them. And finally, I want to ask what has worked and where do we go from here? Now, although I'm only a few minutes into this presentation, I've already used a couple of terms that could use some definition, namely public history and neoliberalism. The National Council on Public History in the United States defines public history as the many and diverse ways in which history is put to work in the world. And it's this idea of putting history to work that I want to focus on today. And as well in this presentation, I'm making the case in particular for a public history that explains settlers to ourselves. And this is something that I argued for in the pages of BC History Magazine last year. And if you haven't read that article, please check it out. You can see it online. Now, in short, this is a public history that recognizes that colonialism has not ended and that the structure of our society today in British Columbia and Canada is one rooted in and indeed reliant upon the ongoing dispossession of Indigenous peoples. And this uh, picks up on something that Chad Reimer was talking about yesterday, which is that we need to develop new narratives in BC history. When it comes to defining neoliberalism, the, the sort of dictionary definition is a political approach that favors free market capitalism, deregulation, and reduction in government spending. <clears throat> 
Now, under neoliberalism in British Columbia, public history most often receives financial support if it contributes to the economic benefits of tourism, economic recovery, or has the potential to influence electoral outcomes. And this, I, uh, I want to point to the slides here in this little excerpt from Professor Rosemary Coombe, who has written a lot about um, heritage and, and legal uh, structures and anthropology. And she notes that um, we're witnessing a new dominance of market ideologies in heritage management with an increasing emphasis on investment in cultural resources and human capital so as to yield economic returns. So a little bit of context for the first part that I want to talk about, which is Point Ellis House Museum and Gardens. Very briefly, Point Ellis House was built in 1861-62 for the Wentworth Wallace family, and it later was home to three generations of the O'Reilly family, Peter and Caroline O'Reilly and their children from 1865 to 1975. It was in 1974 that the NDP government announced a decision to purchase Point Ellis House and its collection. So the house itself, two acres of heritage designated gardens and at least 12,000 objects inside the house. This acquisition of Point Ellis House continued the work of heritage proper, property acquisition, which began in the 1950s with the purchase and restoration of Barkerville. Now, today I don't want to give the impression that the mid 1970s through to the 1990s were a windfall of financial support for provincial heritage sites. But there were well paid provincial employees being paid to carry out and oversee research and conservation at places like Point Ellis. Although the 1980s were a time of austerity in British Columbia and across Canada, provincial heritage properties did continue to be acquired and staffed by the provincial government. For example, in 1981, Hat Creek Ranch was purchased. Now, these sites were, and still are, expected to make up for limited funding by focusing on revenue generation, especially as it pertains to tourism. And at Point Ellis House, to bring in tourists, especially American tourists, throughout the 80s and the 90s, the romance, and really up until very recently, the romance of the Victorian era and tea service on the lawn was implemented. I've spoken elsewhere about the impact of the particular interpretive narratives that accompanied this tea service approach and tourism approach at Point Ellis House. So I'm not gonna go into great detail here about that. You can check out my VIU Arts and Humanities Colloquium presentation from 2021, which is on YouTube. But this focus in bringing tourists for tea is reflective of an understanding of provincial heritage sites as potential contributors to the regional or the provincial economy, rather than sites that tell us people who are living here or even visiting here, something about how the past shapes our present. The impact of this understanding of provincial heritage sites is abundantly, abundantly clear to us today at Point Ellis House. The number one comment we get from local people who visit the site without fail every day we are open and my staff will vouch for this as will the volunteers is quote, I've lived here my whole life and I've never visited or I came once ages ago for tea and I never came back. So whatever provincial heritage sites were bringing in from things like tea service, by the early 2000s, the, the financial burden on the provincial treasury was still deemed to be too great for the BC Liberal government which took power in 2001. These provincial heritage sites were devolved away from direct, direct provincial management and contractors, mostly nonprofits were brought on to manage the sites. And this is the policy currently in place at most of the provincial heritage sites. In 2004, the Capital Mental Health Association was given just $40,000 to run Point Ellis House. And by its own admission in the newspapers at the time, they knew nothing about heritage management. 
Now, at Point Ellis House, the focus on tea service and trying to save money because of the, the limited operational funding that was being given by the government meant that there was no full-time professional staff and even well-meaning volunteers and occasional part-time staff could not keep up with vital deferred maintenance, conservation, and care of the gardens and collection. Um, just to go back to this slide for a moment, um, you can see how the funding increased, and I use that word loosely, uh, although it did go up over the last number of years, from $40,000 in 2004 to $75,000 in 2018, $80,000 in 2022. There's an asterisk there because, uh, as I'll explain later, we did get a couple of one-time temporary boosts to our funding. In 2007, a consultant report commissioned by the province noted that site operations are considered to be unsustainable. Without meaningful change, many of the properties which are so important to the heritage of BC and the economies of their communities are destined for closure and failure. This is 2007. In that report, it was indicated that Point Ellis House should receive $236,000 annually for regular maintenance and operations. A few years later, in 2011, Heritage BC um, noted that the situation had not really improved and described history and heritage work in the province as at a crisis or at a tipping point. Now, when I look at our current operational funding at Point Ellis House, um, this 2007 recommendation tells me that we're very far away from that. In our contract to operate the site, it says we will get $80,000. And in 2007, they said that the minimum was $236,000. That's a big gap. But let me fast forward through the aughts and most of the 2010s to 2019 when the Vancouver Island Local History Society, my employer, took over management at Point Ellis House. Now, although our site management agreement only boosted operational funding by $5,000 annually compared to the previous not-for-profit society, as I mentioned, we did manage to secure a couple of one-time boosts to this. Thank, thanks in part to another one-time boost to the Provincial Heritage Branch budget. Still, we have not come close to the $236,000 in 2007 dollars. And if you've bought groceries lately, you'll know that inflation is a real thing. Combined with limited funding for projects uh, from the Provincial Heritage Branch, we are making a go of it. But one-time boosts do not fix structural problems. And each year is spent wondering if we will or will not receive another boost to keep us employed and operating the site. It's anxiety inducing to say the least. And so ever since 2019, I've been organizing and advocating for sustainable operational funding for Point Ellis House and all provincial heritage sites. This takes up a significant amount of my time. I've been in the media many times making the case. I've connected with a number of the other provincial heritage sites on the issue, coordinating, collaborating. We even managed to get a joint letter and a letter writing campaign sent off to the minister responsible at the time, the Minister of Forest, Katrina Conroy. And we even got a meeting with the minister in the late summer of 2021. While the minister commissioned yet another report on this issue, the meeting did reveal the dominant view of government when it comes to public history work in British Columbia. Why don't you charge people? Specifically, the minister asked about bringing in school groups and charging these school groups to learn from their publicly owned heritage site. Of course, even if we charged every single student in School District 61, Victoria, to access Point Ellis House, this still would not make up for that gap in funding. We would still be a very long way from the 2007 funding recommendation. 
Now on April 1st of this year, the Provincial Heritage Branch moved to the Ministry of Tourism, Arts, Culture, Sport. And the report that was requested by Minister Conroy appears to have stalled. I don't know what our funding will be next spring. And that means that I don't know if Point Ellis House staff will have jobs or indeed if Point Ellis House will be open to the public. Throughout it all and throughout the pandemic, we have been doing public history work that explains settlers to ourselves by revising and updating interpretive narratives at the site and by making our collection and stories more accessible we are seeing a majority of our visitors coming here for the first time, and they are coming back, something that was not common in the tea service era at Point Ellis House. When it comes to the story of colonization in British Columbia and Canada, this is the truth part of truth and reconciliation, talking about the past and the colonial past and how it impacts the present. Yes, provincial sites are colonial sites. Most of them are linked to the Fraser River and Caribou gold rushes, preserved at a time when frontier and romantic narratives were deployed to develop a particular view of our past, one that supported feel-good tourism and therefore local and regional economies. But developing, presenting, and engaging with the truth part of Truth and Reconciliation at a site like Point Ellis House is incredibly difficult without the financial support to pay people a living wage to do the work. Now, what would Premier Horgan say in response to all of this? He might say a lot of things, but his political staff would likely draw up a list of funding opportunities that have been created in the last couple of years. For example, the Unique Heritage Infrastructure Grant. In 2020, this grant was launched. You could apply for up to a million dollars and Point Ellis House applied for $480,000 to address only the most high risk deferred maintenance at Point Ellis House, things like rotten wood, painting the house, et cetera. We received no funding through this program even though I worked hard to meet the 29 day application deadline. For this grant, provincially owned heritage sites were competing with community sites, perhaps a reason that the anonymous adjudicators didn't support our application. And of course, as many of you know, this fund was oversubscribed, meaning too many people applied for too little money. Or maybe Premier Horgan might point to the BC 150 time immemorial funding opportunity announced in last year and awarded in 2022. In this case, thanks to advocacy from myself and other provincial heritage sites, our sites did receive small direct awards to address some of our deferred maintenance. Here at Point Ellis House, we received $160,000. Sounds like a lot. Remember, we need at least $500,000 to address the only the high most high risk items on our list. We were also, however, able to apply to the general fund, and I submitted two applications in two different streams, one to create a permanent exhibit about the Indian Reserve Commission. Peter O'Reilly, who lived at Point Ellis House, was the Indian Reserve Commissioner for BC and Canada for 18 years. And the other application was to reinstate our historic greenhouse and upgrade our patchwork of irrigation in our heritage gardens, both to facilitate heritage conservation and food security programming, which we operate here at Point Ellis House. Through these two applications, we received uh, partial funding for irrigation system upgrades. The program of the BC 150 fund was also oversubscribed, too many people applying for too little money. Interestingly, the Indian Reserve Commission exhibit, the work of explaining settlers to ourselves was not funded. The truth part of the grant that was supposedly intended to focus on, quote, raising cultural awareness and recognizing BC's diversity received no money. 
But I suppose this is what happens when a once in 20 year funding opportunity comes along. A number of priorities are lumped together to the detriment perhaps of the stated goal. And even if all of these projects were fully funded, how will I carry them out if our lack of operating funds means that all staff have to be let go next year because we won't see a boost in our funding? I want to also point out here that there's been a pandemic and what little revenue we do make from visitors coming to the site was reduced to zero through much of 2020 and 2021. We received zero targeted pandemic support from the province to make up for this, though private sites like Butchart Gardens did, but a little bit more on that later. Now, John Horgan might also point to his government's support of the Chinese Canadian Museum and the South Asian Museum and the Japanese Canadian internment redress. And he would be right that these are incredibly important projects. So yes, kudos to the government for funding these projects. They allow these communities to be stewards of their stories. But in five years, will these new museums be receiving sustainable operating funds? Will they be paying their staff a living wage? It remains to be seen. In my view, Nowhere is the neoliberalization of public history better displayed than at the Royal BC Museum and BC Archives. As with many of you, my work relies on access to the BC Archives at the RBCM. The majority of the archival collection of Point Ellis House was transferred to that institution in the 1970s, which means that when we need to conduct research or put on an exhibit like we're doing this summer, we have to take a trip to the BC Archives. Lucky for us, it's just down the harbor, at least for now. Now, in 2003, 2004, the same year that the provincial heritage sites were devolved away from government management, the Royal BC Museum and the provincial archives were merged into a new crown corporation. Again, the idea from government was that this would save the province money. And indeed, up until the recent announcement of a new museum, it did save the government a lot of money. The institution today receives about $1.4 million less in operating funding than it did in 2004. Now consider the ways, the many ways that we now expect the provincial museum to respond to the matters of the day. Repatriation, truth and reconciliation, climate and biodiversity crises. Now consider how this institution should do that with less funding for operations than it had 20 years ago. Well, we know how it tries to do that. It charges people. It charges for access. Admission up until recently was almost $130 for a family to visit the museum. Or it charges for tours. And my focus for the next few minutes, it charges, in some cases, for access and use of certain archival documents. In 2015, I joined the board of directors of the Friends of the BC Archives. And I soon became familiar with the issue of licensing and reproduction fees at the BC Archives and the museum. FBCA members, especially those located outside Victoria and those publishing books on BC history, regularly raised concerns about the cost of licensing and reproducing images from the archives. And so in 2019, the FBCA created a report that clearly showed that the Royal BC Museum and Archives proprietary approach to its collections meant that authors, museums, filmmakers, etc., were choosing to simply not use the images and documents found there because they simply couldn't afford it. As one example, at the time, the RBCM wanted to charge $25 to post-secondary teachers to show an image to their class on a PowerPoint slide. Now, I'm happy to say that thanks to the FBC's report, uh, which was endorsed by the BC Historical Federation, the, these kinds of ridiculous policies were done away with, but most of these fees still exist. Perhaps most egregious among the RBCM's uh, decisions to, to address some of uh, its collections and its research 
is that they charge $10 to download a PDF of research that was conducted by the museum decades ago. So Sound Heritage, for example, which was produced in the 1970s and the 1980s, public research done with public money at a public institution 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, now costs you $10 to access online. Speaking of the Friends of the BC Archives, one of the most important programs that we run is the Terry Rexton Memorial Fund, which is currently the only grant program in the province specifically for community archives. Prior to 2001, the BC Archives, the province, did administer something called the Community Archives Grant Program, which assisted local archives with purchases of equipment, supplies, conservation, and to fund arrangement and description projects. This funding was eliminated shortly after the Liberal government came to power and has never been reinstated. The Terry Rexton Fund stepped in and now does that work. Where governments abandoned programs, overworked and under-resourced nonprofits usually step in. It is a hallmark of neoliberalism. What I'm trying to show here is that neoliberalism's impact on public history is to reduce, close off, and monetize access, or to make a few people running not-for-profits work so hard that they burn out and quit. And that's just not just me and, and my, my feelings and the feelings of my staff, but you know, recently the BC Museums Association held an entire seminar on burnout in the sector. I know a lot of you listening to this are feeling the same way. Not unlike BC's labor movement, I think that people in the heritage sector had really great hopes that the BC NDP government would smash the status quo. But even the Minister of Tourism's mandate letter to the RBCM belies neoliberalism's grip on the government and on our society. The rhetoric is good, but the directives send the institution in two competing directions. The minister says, make the museum and archives more accessible, more available to all British Columbians. That's wonderful, that's noble. Uh, but then it also says, explore commercial opportunities to contribute to the museum's financial position. In other words, the same thing that the museum has been doing for the last almost 20 years, charge people for access, privatize, monetize, take a proprietary approach, and of course, fundraise as well, another hallmark of neoliberalism, rely on philanthropy. What's paradoxical about all of this is that there is plenty of research that shows the spread effects, to use an economics term, of open access policies and direct financial support for public history or work in the glam sector generally. In other words, supporting the work of making collections freely accessible and usable has greater social and economic impacts than not doing so. The policy I have up on the screen here is from the National Gallery of Art in the United States. And you can see that this is their approach to their collections that they have put online. Something that would be really wonderful to see the RBCM do, but unfortunately it has not done so. And this is what the, the FBC report from 2019 asks for. And uh, it specifically points to the City of Vancouver archives and their policies as something that the RBCM should consider mirroring. But neoliberal thinking is clearly ingrained. We need only look at how the announcement of the new Royal BC Museum, setting aside the PR nightmare that that was, uh, has provided fodder to those who think that we should not be investing in museums. The legislature and the editorial pages are replete with comments about how we have to choose between hospitals and museums. A false dichotomy, a false choice brought to you by neoliberal ideology, which says that uh, there is a scarcity of funds in order to gain support for devolution and divestment of public resources. <clears throat> 
I'm not saying here that there's no need for a new museum, but there's no strategy to support wider access here either. Instead of making museum admission free or making public use of collections and research free, we're getting a $1 billion museum. We in the sector know how things could be improved. Indeed, there are past government programs, which I have pointed to some of them, that we know worked, but we weren't asked. Furthermore, as many of you, uh, so many people have pointed out, a building itself does not demonstrate a commitment to truth and reconciliation. Policymakers and politicians need to understand that the stories we have told ourselves about BC's past are very much a factor in how Indigenous peoples in this province have been and are treated and viewed. The government can update the narratives in Victoria, but what about all the other places in this vast place where people encounter history? Including at universities and colleges. Exposing people to archival research and public history, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it, is something that I bring to my teaching work at Vancouver Island University. In 2015, I joined the Department of History there as a contract or what they call non-regular faculty member. I remain a contract faculty member there today. In 2016, I was asked to teach 19th century BC history, a course offered for the first time in a number of years because those who had previously taught it had all retired. No full-time or permanent person with expertise in BC history was hired to replace them. This year, I was lucky enough to teach Vancouver Island history for the first time since last century. Yes, Vancouver Island University has not taught Vancouver Island history since the 20th century. Until, that is, this last spring. Now, this job requires a PhD. And just so you know, I get paid about the equivalent of $17.50 an hour to teach it. And that's the starting wage at most a &Ws. My classes have now worked with the Nanaimo Museum and the Nanaimo Community Archives on a few different occasions. And through these projects, including the most recent a project that we worked on with my colleague, Dr. Catherine Rollwagon's class, uh, a community exhibit at the Nanaimo Museum called The Word on the Street, Roads That Built Nanaimo. Um, these projects, through these projects, many students stepped inside an archive for the first time in their life, to say nothing of learning how to do research inside of one. And keep in mind, this is a third year class. While students are certainly exposed to primary source research in other history classes, it's much harder to conduct archival research on Jacques Cartier or the Reformation in Nanaimo. My students' comments on these courses reveal a strong desire to learn more about the place that they are living and working in. Yet, at universities and colleges, full-time and permanent faculty dedicated to the study of British Columbia are increasingly scarce. And when one retires, it's unlikely that they will be replaced with another permanent full-time position. Those of us in attendance here today may take for granted our understanding of the province's past, or even our ability to conduct primary source research and communicate our findings. Interestingly, Vancouver Island University has a teacher education program, a very excellent teacher education program, and many of my students have gone on or will go on to teach social studies out there at your local elementary and secondary schools. But if British Columbia history is not offered at Vancouver Island University, that is, if I'm not teaching it, what BC history will these teachers be teaching? The crisis of a growing reliance on contract teaching at colleges and universities in Canada is also a public history problem. 
If students are not exposed to BC history, we cannot lament a lack of engagement with it. Now, this statistic on the screen here from the Canadian Association of University Teachers shows you just how expansive this problem is throughout the country and in BC as well. They say the drop in full-time full-year positions is also evident in the census, which shows a decline of 10% from 2005 to 2015. During the same period, universities professors working part-time, part-year, increased by 79%. The casualization of post-secondary history teaching and teaching generally is also a public history problem. This is a problem rooted in neoliberalism and the underfunding of post-secondary institutions and the gutting of arts and humanities programs in particular in favor of new institutes and programs that service the latest economic trend. A reflection of the ideas that universities and colleges, like museums, heritage sites, and public history, are meant to serve the economy, not produce and share knowledge for the betterment of our communities. In other words, organizations such as the BC Historical Federation should recognize that the casualization of university and college history departments is also a problem for history work generally, as is the increasing inaccessibility of post-secondary education generally due to rising tuition fee costs for students. Now, if our sector was in crisis in 2011, as indicated in the Heritage BC report, then I suppose in 2022, we are on what I like to call life support, at least at Point Ellis House. We get just enough funding to keep the lights on and the gardens watered. The rest we're expected to make up by charging the public for access. And as I frequently see from public history job postings, some places make up for this lack of operational funding by offering low wages. Of course, it's not like the government couldn't fund us sustainably if it wanted to. It's not that the government couldn't increase funding to post-secondary education or make public research freely available, but that's not how neoliberalism works. Now, if it's about votes or if it's about support for a tourism economy and the private sector, the funds will flow. Take, for example, the province's announcement last year of the Major Tourism Operators Grant. Up to $1 million available in grants, a number of which went to private companies. Point Ellis House wasn't eligible because we're not major enough, according to the grant criteria. The RBCM also not eligible because it's a crown corporation. However, the privately run Butchart Gardens, a company called Luxury Transport Incorporated, and Grouse Mountain Resort, owned by the billionaire Gagliardi family, did receive up to $1 million free from the government. Let me very briefly touch upon support for public history at a local level, specifically here in Victoria and the capital region. Support for public history in Victoria and the CRD, Capital Regional District, is basically non-existent. If you're the owner of a heritage home, however, you can get a grant from the city of Victoria for a new roof or to paint it but there are no grants for local history of any kind. In fact, heritage and local history exhibits are explicitly excluded from funding through the Capital Regional District's arts and culture grants. If public history isn't culture, then what is it? I'll also take this opportunity to note that Point Ellis House is not eligible for funding through the BC Arts Council, which does have programs that support museum exhibits. Why? Well, because we're a heritage site and they say that they don't fund heritage sites. Now, of course, we're also a museum. It's, it's right there in the name. But they say that we're a heritage site owned by the, by the province. Therefore, we're not eligible. But we're a not-for-profit charity that manages it. But we're owned by the province, so we're not. You see the circular logic that I find myself trapped in. Nevertheless, it's very clear, at least through my experience, that there is no provincial strategy for history work in British Columbia. 
funding is piecemeal and tied up with economic benchmarks and electioneering. As with every other aspect of our society, neoliberal capitalism has convinced the politicians and many of our family and friends that public history only matters if it provides economic return. Public history can and should be playing a significant role in the truth of truth and reconciliation. The potential contribution to the gross domestic product does not and should not matter. If our organizations are afraid to, quote, bite the hand that feeds us, even if it only feeds us every decade, we are not doing ourselves any favors. The crisis has been going on for 20 years, if not longer. It's time to move beyond a focus on tourism and economy in our rhetoric and to demand better than the status quo from our politicians. There has been one funding program that I think was recently a great success. And so I want to highlight it here. Um, and in fact, it's really the only reason that myself and other staff still have jobs. That is the COVID-19 reopening fund provided by the federal government through their museums assistance program. Up to $100,000 was available, um, basically just to keep the lights on, just for operational funding. It was a very simple application. It supported operations, not projects, and it allowed us to continue to do the work that we're so passionate about. And this is exactly the kind of grant program that should probably continue outside of whenever we see the other side of this pandemic. It's something also that the province might consider implementing as well. As an organization and a sector, we know what's needed to support meaningful public history. Some of the programs once existed. In some cases, the funding also once existed. We need to continue to collaborate. We need to advocate for the truth of truth and reconciliation and for well-paid full-time history jobs and for well-supported history and heritage sites. Most importantly, however, we need to find the courage to say that it's the economic system and our failure to challenge it that's created this ongoing crisis. If we don't, it will be hard to find the words that describe something worse than crisis or on life support. Perhaps the only word that fits best is closed. Thank you for having me.